NC12 is the 12th ministerial conference of the ministers at WTO. Um, that obviously is a space that's much more oriented towards realizing a free, a free trade system and the right to health is not a priority issue for WTO. Uh, in contrast, the World Health Assembly is hosted by the World Health Organization and the right to health, um, meaning the, the right to the highest attainable standard of well-being is very much at the center of WHO's agenda. So the institutions are different also in terms of their procedures. Uh, WHO is more transparent than WTO so, for example, at the WHA, the agenda is published and the documentation relating to particular agenda items is made available usually in advance. Um, in addition, civil society organizations that are in official relations with WHO can attend the meetings, they're party to discussions, they can listen to discussions of agenda items, uh, and they can make statements from the floor. In contrast, the World Trade Organization is much more closed, so uh, civil society organizations don't have access to meeting rooms, you don't know what's being discussed, and also the proposed texts and so forth are not published as a, a matter of routine. Um, and so in this way, uh, WHO is slightly more open to civil society participation. They can work on similar issues, one example would be food, but they see them very differently. Uh, so WHO, for example, would look at the health effects of food. Food would be um, something that they're concerned about in relation to diabetes, heart disease, and so forth. Uh, and so we've seen in this agenda that WHO is, is addressing um, interventions aimed at mitigating the extent of NCDs, so dealing with the effects, but that they saw a, a kind of constraint in dealing with the commercial determinants of NCDs, so the way in which uh, corporate actors can shape the policy for ex policy landscape, for example. Uh, there's an acknowledgement um, that that's an issue, that that's a problem in WO, WHO documentation, um, but there isn't necessarily uh, an emphatic uh, exclusion of corporate actors and big agri or big food from stakeholder consultations, for example. So. Um, WTO uh, also deals with issues around food, but here the issue is seen as an extension of the trade agenda. Um, but still, these agendas have an impact on social determinants of health. So, for example, one of the items being discussed uh, is an item relating to fisheries uh, and agricultural provisions. Um, and there is a concern that at this ministerial conference, uh, decisions will be taken that harm the livelihoods of small-scale fishers and agricultural producers um, and that give big players in these uh, industries even more power. So obviously that will affect livelihoods and also access to food and in this way down the road it affects also the right to health. Um, but as I said at the beginning, WTO isn't mandated to prioritize the right to health. So uh, similar issues with very different approaches although in both institutions there um, is an openness to consultation with for-profit actors um, yeah, in the, under the guise of, of uh, multi-stakeholderism. Many of the current discussions are aimed at creating an infrastructure that could make uh, responses to health emergency um, more effective, but also uh, one of the, the mandates was to make sure that these responses are more equitable. Um, so there is some concern that some of the, um, the framing around the language of pandemics versus health emergencies, um, that that's likely to undermine equity. So what do I mean by that? A pandemic is something that comes along less frequently uh, than health emergencies. And many of the equity uh, considerations being discussed, in, for example, um, the obligation of wealthier countries to assist uh, developing countries in uh, under conditions of health emergencies. There's a concern that when the language shifts from health emergencies to pandemics, that those kinds of equity considerations only then apply to these much more uh, wide-scale uh, events, um, because pandemics, of course, um, broader in their scope than health emergencies, right? And so ideally we'd like to see equity considerations uh, in responses to 
health emergencies, not just pandemics. Um, so, so there is, there has been a kind of struggle around the language um, used to describe the the kinds of responses to specific these specific two types of interventions. Um, there is a lot of discussion about institutional reforms and increasing efficacy. Uh, and one way in which that discussion has moved is um, a set of proposed amendments by the US government to the international health regulations. So those proposed centralizing decision-making power in the DG, um, it suggests shorter time frames for reporting outbreaks and so forth. Um, and it also limits the obligation to consult with national governments experiencing an outbreak. Um, and so this is something different, um, something that uh, to some extent um, limits, I suppose, if it were to be accepted, the sovereignty or the degree of consultation um, with the states in which outbreaks are happening. So that's, uh, I think, something that might be cause for concern for some countries. Um, there's a lot of discussion about financing for pandemic preparedness, surveillance, uh, and so forth, or alternatively for health emergencies. Um, so the financing discussion is obviously important, but um, it does seem to be centered around uh, a fairly specific issue, which is this issue of health emergencies. Um, and so more extensive uh, attention could be paid to investing in health systems as the foundation of any response to a health emergency. So in other words, right now, the attention seems to be on making health systems resilient during emergencies. Um, but I would argue that uh, a more foundational response is to make sure that health systems are functional all the time. Um, and that could then make them more capable of uh, spotting outbreaks and if needed, uh, responding to, to health emergencies or pandemics. Um, I think another thing to think about in relation to this is that Yes, financing for emergencies is important, um, but so there are other mechanisms that could increase the fiscal space that governments have. One would be looking at um, debt, especially odious debt that, that countries are holding, uh, and that constrains what they available, what they have available to spend on public services like health. Um, and so, debt uh, and austerity policies policies also um, are problematic in terms of. Uh, undermining investments in, in the public health system. Yeah, so um, the TRIPS waiver was uh, introduced in October 2020 by India and South Africa. Um, and it's been, I think, a, a, a steep road uh, in terms of getting uh, WTO members to accept the waiver in its original form. A leaked text was um, released a couple of months ago and it was framed as a text that had been created through consultations with India, South Africa, the EU and the US. Um, so the leaked text seems to be closer to the EU's position throughout the debates on the TRIPS waiver. Of course, the original waiver asked for suspension of many different forms of IP, not only patents. Um, and it also asked for the suspension of the waiver to apply to vaccines, diagnostics, and therapeutics. Uh, what we see is that the leaked text is much narrower. So, for example, um, it only deals with vaccines and that doesn't she seem to have shifted. Um, that um, it's been criticized um, for not really being a waiver at all, but uh, an extension of the EU position that the TRIPS flexibilities are sufficient and so the waiver um, expands on the ways in which, for example, licensing, compulsory licensing can be done to increase access to vaccines in particular. Um, and so I think it's, it's very much an issue that um, is important. I think if the waiver in its original form can be passed, it would set a huge precedent uh, for equity and access to essential medicines. Um, and I think the length of time that it's taken to pass the waiver shows that the IP system is dysfunctional. So even in the midst of a huge crisis, um, it's not doing what it supposedly could do with existing flexibilities. It's been two years, more than two years, and existing flexibilities have not delivered um, tech transfer, increased access to vaccines, and so forth. And so uh, 
um, I, I think it would be regrettable if the leaked text would become the, the baseline position in future um, for future suspensions of IPs during health emergencies. So I think one of the things to look out for in terms of the assembly is to, to have a look at what happens with the conversation around funding for health emergencies and or pandemics. Um, I think it would be really problematic if there was a vertical approach to that because you want the health system as a whole to be strengthened because that's the basis for responding to any kind of health issue, including a health emergency. Um, I think on the point of verticalization, there's a, generally a thread that runs through many of the agenda items that, that issues are somehow considered in silos. Um, and, and so, Again, when we look at the health system as an integrated whole, uh, that's not necessarily something that will strengthen the health system as a whole, uh, particularly not uh, if you're trying to build a comprehensive primary health care approach um, as, as the center of your health system. Um, I think one of the things that's really important um, is the issue of commercial determinants of health, so how for-profit corporations impact health. Um, there, there is this framework for engagement with non-state actors that uh, WHO adopted some years ago. Um, and there, is, uh, there are many agenda items that speak to the need for consultation with corporate actors, non-state actors, including corporate actors, um, that speak to uh, the significance of uh, corporate or private sector sources as sources of funding for WHO's work. Uh, and so I think um, that what happens on that front and how it impacts the power of commercial determinants of health is definitely something to keep an eye on um, because the issue of uh, corporate power is not being front and center, I would say, um, uh, in this agenda. Um, and it's been highlighted, I think, in the context of the pandemic, just really how much of a determinant of, of health transnational corporations can be. Um, I think for MC12, definitely um, what happens in terms of negotiations on fisheries and agriculture, that's important from the point of view of uh, food security, um, food sovereignty, prospects for food sovereignty, um, and livelihoods, so sources of, of income um, that people can use to access all of the other things they need to, to live not, uh, happy lives. Um, and then I think the, the other thing that would be important to keep track of is what happens to these um, so-called JSIs, the Joint Statement Initiatives, particularly the ones focusing on um, e-commerce and, and trade and services, uh, both of which uh, have an impact on the health arena and, and how healthcare is provided in the private sector. Um, so JSIs are not officially part of the agenda, um, but there does seem to be some, some interest by the developed states in particular um, to, to bring them to the meeting. And so that definitely is something to keep in mind.